Welcome to FOB TV, the future of business. I'm your host, Kevin Benedict, futurist at TCS. And I want to thank all of you out there for joining us today. My guest today is Brian Utley, who's the CEO and founder of Periscope Holdings. Thanks for joining us today, Brian. Thank you, Kevin, for having me. I look forward to the discussion. Now, Brian, you're one of the few individuals that I've ever went to LinkedIn looked up their history of where they've been, what they've done, and you have one company listed. <laughs> <laughs> I think I probably have 10 listed in my career. You have one, Periscope Holdings. Talk to us about that. Uh, well, you know, my history is, is political campaigns. I ran campaigns for 12 years, so um, did that for many, many years, and then I uh, had the pleasure at the end of that career working for John Sharp, the Texas com comptroller. Um, and now he's the chancellor at A&M. Uh, very, very smart guy. Learned a lot from he and his team. We actually, we, we had a thing that was created called Texas Performance Review where we saved the state $8 billion. Um, and through that, my next career was Periscope. We, we started this company to really helped government save money. Procurement, it was highly inefficient. You know, there, wasn't much, there weren't many technologies out there in the market that helped fix the problem. And so we started that in 2001 and I've been doing it ever since. All right, <laughs> and, where, and where are you calling in from today, Brian? Uh, we're in Austin, Texas. So we have a, 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 an office in Austin and we have an office in Salt Lake City. Um, mm. So I'm calling from my home in Austin. I am hunkered down during the coronavirus with my three daughters and wife and, and my other daughter and my grandson are out at their house just west of town, but we're all hunkered down. Wow. Now, this is probably the strangest period of my entire life. How, you know, what's, what's your perspective on it, Brian? Wow, I never thought I'd see it. Um, you know, I just didn't, um, I never kind of envisioned complete lockdown. I think as Americans, you never kind of think about that, right? You're, it's so individual freedoms. Um, and, you know, you have to now think of, of, of your community and, and forgo your individual freedoms to help the, you know, help the community, help the, um, think of it as a whole and, and, and less about, you know, um, getting out there and doing whatever I want to do when, when it can affect everybody else. So I think it's, it's a, it's a sobering moment in our time, but I think we're going to come out out of this stronger than ever. I just think that's what we are as Americans. And, you know, uh, you know, and, and I'm a Texan five generations. So as Texans, we're definitely going to come out stronger and bigger because that's yeah. what we say. Right. <laughs> that's right. So, um, I've written a lot, and my colleagues on the future of business here at TCS have written a lot over the last month on, um, you know, how how this experience with the pandemic is going to change perspectives on supply chains. You know, there's been a lot of things exposed, weaknesses in the supply chain that are all making us kind of rethink how we do things. Now, Periscope Holdings is unique in that you guys are focused on states, cities, counties, all kinds of municipal governments, fire departments, police departments, even sports districts. So anything to do with government there, that's a whole different perspective on the supply chain. From your vantage point there in Austin and with your customer base and your support of, what is it, seven states now, talk to us about you know, what you're seeing as the impact on those supply chains. Well, I mean, it's a it's a huge impact. I think, you know, I, I, we've seen emergency situations in dealing with the supply chain hurricanes, for example, we have a lot of customers in the hurricane zone. So, you know, we we are very versed in, you know, very local oriented hurricane hits, you gotta you gotta have an emergency center, you gotta you gotta buy goods. But what what we see in those hurricane centers through, you know, our technologies is, is you get emergency vendors set up in a system. So they're contracted to be emergency supplier. You know, the, 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 the one thing I found out in the first hurricane we had to help in was um, outhouses is what they need first. They need restrooms. Well, it's like toilet paper now. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the first thing people think of. So, you know, you had to set up a contract. It was in an emergency. You had to deliver the outhouse within 12 hours, and you were committed to that contractually. So the vendor had to store those outhouses and make sure they were available in these hurricane centers. And so you had contracts set up for that. A lot of our customers had that. What they didn't have was pandemic type stuff, healthcare stuff. I think we've moved to such a just in time philosophy and less about inventories. You know, when you're when you're buying stuff as a government, you buy to consume. You know, you're not buying to build a computer to sell. You know, when we talk supply chain, I think a lot of people think about I gotta buy something it's going to build something and I got to put all this together and then I'm going to sell it in the market where governments buy to consume, strictly buy to consume. And I think what we didn't think about, um, nobody did is that what supplies do we have on hand, ready available in our supply chain that we can put our hands on it. It doesn't have to be, it's not just in time anymore. You know, everybody's gotten rid of inventory. You know, most governments don't carry inventory anymore. So they live in this just-in-time supply chain. I think we got to rethink that. I think we got to rethink what we produce overseas, um, whether it's China or it's it's another country. I think we have to, you know, we have to look at North America. Um, you know, I think we have to really bring, you know, from a national security or a state security or a city security, we have to look at vendors that that can produce this, and you know, in the U.S. that we can get a hold of it that something doesn't happen and, you know, China shuts down the supply chain and we're kind of stuck. I think we got to think of all those different things, you know, I think we got to replenish the, you know, our stockpile of goods for pandemics. I don't think this might be the last. I think we're going to, you know, we might, we might see more of this. So, so Brian, now when I think of local government, in most cases, doesn't local co- government look to buy local anyway? They look to buy local if they can get a hold of it, but they 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 buy all over, right? I mean, it's okay. it's it's an important factor to buy local, um, but I think they buy you know they buy nationally, national big vendors. They buy from local vendors, um, so I think it's you know I think they they spread it around, um, but I think that um, from a from in states try to buy local. There's you know there's a whole bunch of that going on. I mean we. On our on our platform, we have a database of about five hundred thousand vendors that are that are small business vendors, uh, medium sized business vendors, and that's a big thing on our platform that you can reach out to that vendor network and and you can find vendors at a local level. Um, but I still think you have to have a you have to have a diverse vendor base in these times. Oh yeah, so let's talk about your solutions there. What is the role that your platform at Periscope Holdings plays in supply chains for government? So, I mean, we're, we only do government procurement and it's all e-procurement marketplace. But the interesting thing about ours is we're not just an e-procurement provider and a, and a marketplace provider. We actually work with vendors on the other side of the supply chain where we work with vendors to get opportunities. So they get opportunities through us and that's how we have 500,000 vendors. So they're getting RFPs, ITBs. These are all types of, of procurement methods. And they get that network of bids through us. So when you think about, we're not just in the e-procurement world where a lot of suppliers are. We're actually in the vendor world, too, with opportunities. So where we've played an interesting part in this is we, we've actually been able to reach out to these small and mid-sized businesses, 500,000 of them, where a lot of governments have to pick up the phone and call them. Even if you have an e-procurement system, because typically in an e-procurement system in government, you just have your seven to 10,000 suppliers that you're used to working with. So we've been able to actually reach out to this massive vendor database to figure out, okay, who has the goods that we need? Who may, who may be able to build something or retrofit it? and marry that together. So we play kind of a very different part than I thought we might play in, a, in, in the world of kind of e-procurement and supply chain. So you must have been receiving some very interesting phone calls over the last few weeks from your clients. 
um, asking, you know, or asking your advice on facing some of these challenges. Talk to us about some of those challenges that everybody's facing. I think what we've seen is there is a big competition between states to get to get the goods they need. Um, what we've really seen with our um, seven states, and it's actually eight states, because another state um, just one of my friends in, in politics reached out to me and said, hey, can you help, you know, can you help this given state and said, you know, I know your system's not there, but would you be, would you be willing? I've seen what you're doing. We're like, sure, we'll, we'll bring them onto the platform for nothing right now. See what we do. And instead of have a competitive environment, they're actually collaborating. So, I mean, you have states like Illinois and Massachusetts and Nevada and and as you notice, I just named a bunch of states that, that, that have different political affiliations. Yeah. So, which is really cool to see is that, you know, these states are more partnering and trying to help each other and work together, not bidding against each other in our environment. We actually threw an RFI out for the services and the products they needed and, and then, and then told them we did it and came back to them and said, okay, we, we've developed a group that can deliver on these goods. So um, we've seen actually collaboration within our group. And, and I think that's a big deal. Wow. So um, how does your platform, when they go to your platform and they have this desperate need, what tools do you provide them that let them address that? Let's walk through some of the features on that platform. Yeah, so on an e-procurement standpoint, it's rec to check, right? They can, they, our customers, we, you know, we serve over, oh gosh, governments and different pieces of our platform, over a thousand governments and, and then 500,000 suppliers. So from a full e-procurement standpoint, it's rec to check, right? It's the normal e-procurement platform. But what we're doing in this environment is we have this vendor database, and that's a product called BidSync that we acquired a few years ago that's a bid distribution system. So we go out to the market, get all the different bids and opportunities, and we and, and vendors can, can buy those through us, different than the e-procurement platform. So what we said is, man, we have this vast vendor database. So in this time of need, we can actually run our own RFI go find the vendors that have these goods and services because they're small and mid-sized businesses. It's not, I mean, you can't reach them any other way, right? And so when they answered the RFI, we actually loaded their products into our marketplace. So now our governments can shop the marketplace, uh, right? We also vetted those vendors through either DNB, Dunn's number, or we have another report that we upload. But also the governments now can 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 shop in that environment. So in the time this time we we just done something differently that we didn't you know we really never thought of with the product. Um, and we waive fees to government. We waive sixty day fees to the vendors, and you know we're just we're we're providing a collaboration environment and a shopping environment. So the marketplace is consumer looking, but it has government rules built into it. Uh, well, thank you so much for what you guys are doing out there, Brian. So, you know, this is unprecedented. That's the word you used when we very first started this interview. And in this unprecedented environment, it must shape kinds of existing processes uh, just right to their core. What are some of the weak links that are being exposed in these supply chains through this experience? I think some of the weak links and what I would say is the just in time inventory, you know, I mean, that's been, you know, that's, we've all preached it for years. I'll say I was one of the, I mean, I've preached it. Why have inventory? Well, now we know we, there's certain things we have to stockpile. Um, and so that's a weak link. I think a weak link is I'm not sure we all realized how much was actually produced overseas and in China mm -hmm. um, that, that we, we have to have produced here. I actually, I had a call, which was very interesting, with a, a medical testing group that has, has the test for coronavirus. They can actually produce the test, and they can produce it in, in really quick time. But they don't have the material, the package with the test, to actually do it in mass production. They can't get the tubes and all those kind of things. So to me, that's a breakdown in supply chain. Well, guess where most of that comes from? Well, it comes from China. So how, how do we as a 
country or a state or a local government relook at this supply chain, and especially when it comes to healthcare and, and this kind of environment. So I think it's supply chain. I also think that the technology that governments are running is old. Um, you know, I, I think governments lived in the world of let's all buy ERPs, big ERPs, and that will be what will fix all our woes and how we do things. And I'm like, you know, the ERP is not going to help you in this world. It's just not. I mean, it doesn't have vendor databases. It doesn't have marketplaces. It doesn't have, from a procurement standpoint, what we need when we're dealing with supply chain. I mean, we've seen it in the private sector that, that they've moved to really e-procurement systems and, and getting everybody online. I mean, you'd be surprised. Government? I mean, I've seen some of our governments that still don't have laptops. So 10% of the workforce can even work. So when you not just talk about supply chain, you talk about technology. And, you know, it's surprising where our governments kind of sit today in, 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 in technology, working online, cloud-based systems, technology, and how they get their supplies. So I don't think it's just supply chain. It's actually a technology problem. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Suddenly, everyone has to stay at home. And uh, a lot of governments, especially small ones, probably aren't set up to support all the security required around there. Everybody's jumping on to these, you know, webcast kind of platforms and TV platforms and Zoom based platforms. But, you know, they have their own inherent risk as well. So, my, I mean, my kids, my kids school was better equipped to do this. Wow. From a technology perspective. And that, to me, is something we really have to look at as a country. Because I think, you know, um, I think that's, that, that is, that's saying a lot. I mean, I think actually sometimes locals are more prepared than, you know, we are at a state level and then even look at it at a national level. I mean, I've heard some people say that the military needs to take over procurement. I'm like, well, I've looked at military procurement. That's why I'm not in the federal government because, I mean, when it takes 10 years to buy a piece of weaponry that's out of date after 10 years to hit the battlefield, I mean, that's not very, that's not great supply chain. So I think you, you know, and I think each state kind of works differently, right? I think the way they do things and their laws are different. So I think you have to look at it that way. So but, Brian, let me ask you in the next question, let me make it a two-part question here. Mm-hmm. What strategies do you think kind of in general, do you think you'll see change within the state, city, and county governments as a result of this experience? And the second part of that, what kinds of strategies do you think Periscope Periscope Holdings will change as a result of this experience? I think strategies that will change is stockpiles. I think they'll carry inventories that they need to carry. I think um, they'll start looking for vendors that are American, local, at home vendors. You know, they'll, they'll, I mean, they'll literally be looking at, at, at vendors that are, you know, the question will be asked, is it made in the USA? Is it, you know, are we going, you know, or is it made? Can you, you know, can you get your hands on it? I think they're going to have definite strategies around emergency procurement. I think we can learn a lot of what, the, what some of the Gulf Coast cities have done um, in, in, in basically contract a, a, you know, if you supply mass to us, then you are required underneath your contract in an emergency situation, you have to be able to full, fulfill our entire order, which actually puts the, you know, puts it really on the manufacturer to hold the inventory. So um, I think those kind of strategies will change um, and we'll, we'll encourage that. And, and, and we'll probably do some we'll probably do some development inside our systems that actually help manage that because we do it at the at the where, where cities have hurricanes um, and states have hurricanes. So I think those are some strategies that will change um, us as a company. You know, I was really proud of our company. I mean, we shut down on the five o'clock on the sixth of March. We we're up and going support everything on the seventh. That morning, 7 a.m., we were rocking. Everybody, uh, you know, people took their headsets from their from the support center and took them home with them. Um, I, I mean, I'd say sometimes we're, we're actually more efficient because people aren't in traffic. 
Because <laughs> in Austin, Texas, you got a lot of traffic. Um, but no, I was really proud of our team. I think we're going to look at our product a lot and see, um, you know, see how we can, you know, help governments manage this a little bit better. I think we need to do, this was something I actually wrote down today that we need to do. So we do testing on our products um, with government on security, you know, all these kind of testings, you know, ADA requirements. I think governments need to go through a test and I think we can help facilitate that through really good systems. If a pandemic hit and we had this many people infected and we needed this many masks, how could we get that done? Mm -hmm. How many amounts would we need? We, we're now testing our abilities to supply. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think there's a way you can use technology and go through you know, test cases on that. Oh, that's fascinating. Brian, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of the middle of this busy day for you, uh, where you're working with all the states, counties, and city governments out there to make sure they have the products they need for their, um, for their people. So thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing and for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's a, it's a pleasure, and thank you for thank you for including government on your on your show. I think it's important that people understand government's a lot different than private sector, and I, I appreciate you you focusing on that today. And thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. You're welcome, Brian. And I want to thank everyone out there for tuning in today.